Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is July 15th, and my guest is Peter Blair Henry, the Kanosuke Matsushita Professor of International Economics at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business. Peter, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you, Russ. It's a pleasure to be talking with you. In recent years, there's been very influential work trying to show the importance of institutions for a country's growth and its ability to escape from poverty. What is the claim of that literature? What do people mean by institutions, and why are they important? So let me talk broadly about what people mean by institutions. And when people talk about institutions, they really have in mind sort of really sort of two classes in the literature. One is sort of the legal institutions, uh, which is namely, when you think of a country's legal system, uh, is it closer to what we call an English common law system or uh, French uh, civil law kind of What's system? What's the difference between those two? Well, uh, without going too much in the, too much in the details, uh, English common law uh, gives very strong protection to things like private property, creditors, uh, and um, and so on. Uh, the French civil law system uh, requ- uh, places much less emphasis on on the protection of individual individual property. And as economists, we think that things that protect uh, individual property rights are really critical uh, because protecting individual property rights uh, gives in- individuals incentive to, for instance, if I have a literally a piece of property, a um, physical piece of property, let's say a piece of land, if I uh, can be sure that I'm going to be able to reap the benefits uh, from the, the, the economic uh, rents that the land generates, then I'm much more likely to actually, uh, literally, to invest to put a structure on that land, uh, to plant crops, and do other things that will require me to actually uh, be the sole claimant to the fruits of, the, of, that, of that land. And so laws which protect uh, property rights in, in that way are more likely, we think, um, to generate uh, economic activity that's, uh, that is uh, dependent on, 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 strong, on strong protection in that sense. And so there's sort of legal institutions, uh, and then there are also um, the other kinds of institutions. Um, uh, for instance, we can think about um, the extent to which uh, I, I talked about, I've already talked a little about, about property rights, the way that legal systems, uh, legal systems uh, uh, help with that. Um, but one of, the, uh, one of the, the things that people have been thinking about uh, more generally is um, – so actually, not, really not more generally, more, spe- more specifically. So let me, let me back up for a second. So there's the, there's the legal institutions literature, which, is, which has been uh, uh, written about by people like Andre Schleifer and others. Um, but then uh, thinking about uh, beyond just the, 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 the channel from legal systems to, uh, to, to the protection of creditors and so on and, and private property rights, there's a very specific set of uh, laws protecting private property that, that countries have in place which are, again, often determined uh, by the nature of um, their colonial origins. So in the same way that a country uh, adopts a legal system, either French civil law or English common law, depending on whether they're, uh, they're colonized or the country that colonized them was England or France, uh, whether a country has very strong uh, property rights uh, often depends on uh, who they were colonized by. And one of the findings in the literature that emphasizes uh, property rights specifically, as opposed to kind of legal systems generally, is that countries that were um, located in areas uh, of the world that were more desirable uh, for colonizers to actually settle and live in, so places outside of the the malaria belt. (laughs) So think of Kenya versus the Congo, for instance, uh, in the highlands uh, where, where malaria was less of a problem. It would be more, a more desirable place if you were an Englishman in the 18th century or, seven, or 19th century uh, or, or early 20th century uh, to go 
and, and, and literally settle and, and raise a family and build a business as opposed to just going in and extracting gold or whatever other natural resources were there. Uh, so if you, if, you, if you were likely to want to stay there, if, the, if there's a place outside of, the, outside of the malaria belt, then it was much more likely that in those places where, where colonizers came, they would try to put in place uh, institutions that looked like their home institutions. So uh, strong protection of, of, of private property, um, systems of government that, rep- that look more like representative democracy and so on. Rule of law. Rule of law, all of those things. And so what, this, what, this, uh, what the literature has done is to say, well, in general, we've known in, uh, since at least the work of Adam Smith that institutions are cor- good institutions, institutions are correlated with good economic outcomes. So if you look across the world, uh, countries with good institutions have higher income levels than countries with, with bad institutions. So Switzerland is much better off than, than Mozambique. But the question, of course, is, you know, what causes what? Causes what? Right. Uh, you know, does, does favorable economic conditions lead to better institutions, or is it the other way around? Or is there a third thing that causes both, and therefore, because the issue is always going to be, if you want to improve someone's, a country's situation, and they look around at this correlation, they improve their institutions, should they expect a good outcome, and of course, if there's causation runs the other way, they're not going to get anything out of it. Or if there's a third thing, they're not going to get anything out of it. Exactly. So, what do we know about that relationship, or what do we what do we think we know? <laughs> well, so what, do, what we think we know from the from this recent work. So, the recent work really tries to build on Adam Smith, Arthur Lewis, and others by saying, let's try to actually to, to tease out the statistical causation. And the more recent work uh, says, well, what do we what, what do we believe? We believe that uh, if a country was colonized. You know, let's say 300 years ago by the British versus the, versus the French, and they inherited strong property rights uh, because they were uh, outside the malaria outside the malaria belt, and, and institutions were set up that you know that looked a lot like like uh, like the home country. Um, then there's no real uh, sense in which who you were colonized by 300 years ago uh, could cause sort of your um, you know t- today's level. Of, of economic, of oh, it could. It couldn't go the other way. Today's right. Today's level of income couldn't be the cause of we couldn't, malaria. Yes, yeah, yeah, three hundred years. Yeah, ago. exactly. Today, yeah, today's level of income couldn't be the cause of malaria three hundred years ago. Excuse me. And so, by by using uh, colonization, the, the 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 nature of your your um, uh, original colonizer, uh, or uh, you know whether you have you know. English common law, or whether you're outside the malaria belt, using that as sort of an instrument, uh, a statistical instrument for um, for institutions, is a way people have sort of gotten at causation. And there's a famous paper by Asimov, Johnson, and Robinson, which shows that um, that in fact there's uh, there seems to be this causal uh, impact of you know of property rights uh, on. Uh, um, on, on, on economic outcomes. Now, of course, you know, it really shouldn't be controversial, right? As you say, not only does it go back to Adam Smith, but it, it's hard to believe that, uh, for example, not having the rule of law or having private property be uh, of uncertain uh, ownership could possibly be good for growth. So I guess the question is always going to be one of magnitude, right? Is that going to be the, the real question? I think there'd be a pretty strong consensus that private property is good for investment. It's mm-hmm. good for property improvement. It's good for entrepreneurship. The question is, is that a small factor or a large factor, right? And, That's and right. I don't know how successful. I don't know that literature very well, but I think that would always be the po- the question as to whether uh, a better way to say it might be, uh, you know, in statistical terms, what's the R squared, meaning – there's a lot of variation. How much of the variation in growth rates? How much of the variation might be explained by these institutional factors? Do we have any idea about about those questions? Yeah, this is this is this is very 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 controversial. And the, the way that you would t- you typically do these exercises is to say, if I go from you know um, a level of um, protection of private property that's akin with uh, Zimbabwe's to that you know that's akin with with, with Switzerland's, which let's say it's a two standard deviation. Change, what is the average effect on income? Now, in order to believe that kind of 
you know, comparative statistical, statistical comparative static, you have to really believe that you've controlled for lots of other everything else. Exactly. Everything else. And so I'm not piece I, of cake. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm I, and, and over over 300 years. So yeah, I'm, it's nothing to it. So I plus, plus the indigenous peoples' differences. I mean, there's just it's an unbelievable challenge. That's right. So I so I think trying to pin down to say you know two standard deviation change and. In, 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 private, in, in the protection of private property is measured by some, you know, randomly constructed, not randomly, but, but, uh, Arbitrary. but arbitrarily constructed index leads to an average of, you know, you know $2,000 difference per capita over some period of time. I don't place a lot of stock in, in, in those specific sort of, sorts of point estimates. Uh, but, I take, so, but, but I take your point that we, we really do want to have a good sense about uh, whether these things really matter. And so... And I think more generally, one of the criticisms of this literature has been because it's so kind of long run in its view that it's very hard to actually um, draw policy conclusions uh, from this. Because suppose you could get away from the issue which you just raised, which is you know, how much confidence can we actually have in the, in the, in the you know, economic magnitude of this effect? The issue then becomes, well, it's, you know, the good news is that you've identified a causal effect. Uh, the bad news is you can do nothing to change your colonial origin. Correct. <laughs> right? and that's, very I, difficult. That's Unless good. you're in like Star Trek or something. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I'm not as Trekkie, but I, I'm sure there's some examples where they go back in time and they get a different colony to, adapt, to take them over. Yeah. So that's the good and bad news about exogeneity. And we don't, have very, we don't have very good theories about institution creation, obviously. You don't... Colonization is only one way to inherit a... There's only way to inherit a set of institutions, but in theory you could alter your institutions. I think in recent years there's We've gotten a lot more skeptical about our ability to do that That's right. uh, successfully. That's right. And also, I think you, if you think about it from the perspective of the agents who are actually trying to implement reasonable policies and or institutions, namely governments, the question that they really want to have answered is, if I undertake policy change or institutional change X, what's the, what's the likely effect? And... That, and for that, uh, it's it's going to be, I think, uh, a little bit hard to point to um, to point to these kinds of studies to really give them a lot of guidance, because they they don't want to know what the effect is going to be over the course of three hundred years. <laughs> Most governments can't <laughs> don't even think a year, two years ahead of the next election, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so the question is, their questions are much more short run um, by the nature of um, the nature of their their, their life cycles, um, and so we really need to have other kinds of studies that, I mean, I, and I don't, mean to, I don't mean to say these are not valuable studies. I think it's really interesting and useful yeah. to, to know some of these things. Yeah. Um, even as you, as, you, as you point out, even if we can't pin down the quantitative effects, to know that they, that they do matter in some qualitative sense um, is important. It gives us more confidence in, you know, our underlying kind of theoretical uh, sort of incentive structures sure. that we think about. Um, but governments do need to make decisions over sort of, you know, a shorter span of time. And so for that, I think one of the things that I've tried to emphasize in the work that I've done the last uh, 10 years or so is that we really need to think less about kind of, uh, kind of pure kind of cross-sectional studies and to think more about uh, time series. And so to ask the, question not, you know, ask the question not, is it the case that countries with better institutions uh, are wealthy or grow faster than countries with poor institutions, but when a particular country changes its policies or institutions, what is the impact of that change, if any, on economic performance over some period of time? So, uh, paper here I want to talk about is uh, a paper you have with Conrad Miller called Institutions versus Policies, A Tale of Two Islands. So what you're doing there is a, a case study approach of sorts. You're comparing... Barbados and Jamaica. And why did you choose those two countries and what were you trying to look at? Yeah. So we chose Barbados and Jamaica because if you, if you go back and look at the literature that we were talking about before, this literature on institutions, whether it be legal institutions or the protection of private property, what that literature tells you uh, is that if you have uh, sort of the right beginnings, right? So if you have sort of the right uh, kind of colonial uh, master uh, and thereby uh, inherit the right kinds of institutions, uh, then things turn out better on average than if uh, you uh, have a French colonizer and inherit French civil law and weaker protection of private property and so on. 
In a malaria belt. In a malaria belt, yeah. yes. <laughs> so, here we have, uh, so here we have two countries that are in very similar parts of the world. They're both in, they're both in fact, in the, in the malaria belt uh, uh, at the time they're, uh, the time they're, they're, they're settled. Uh, they're both, col- they're both um, British colonies. They're both, uh, in fact, slave colonies. Uh, big sugar plantations initially uh, when, they're, when they're settled. So very, very similar beginnings. Uh, and at the time of, of independence, they both inherit basically uh, English common law, Westminster parliamentary democracy, strong constitutional protection of private property. So those three things are kind of three of the key items if you, if you, uh, that would be on sort of the Santa Claus list, if you will, yeah. of things that would lead to good economic outcomes. Now, when did they become independent? Roughly. Jamaica became independent in 1962, Barbados in 1966. Uh, so both a little over, over 40 years ago. But remarkably similar and remarkably light yes. historically. Yes, very, very, very much alike historically. Barbados is a smaller, smaller physically than Jamaica, so there's some differences in the overall physical size. Uh, but both English-speaking, um, uh, culturally very similar. So literally the reason why the, it's, 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 it's interesting to note that there's both slave colonies is that there, slaves are brought to similar places in the Caribbean to perform essentially the same task, to cultivate sugar. So um, in the world of social science, it's, it's, pretty, it's, it's pretty close to, to a laboratory kind of ex- experiment. But slavery ended long before their independence. Yes, that's right. Slavery ended roughly, in, in, uh, in the West Indies roughly 1835, I believe, was, was the abolition. So a uh, fairly long period of time um, post-slavery up until independence, uh, over, over, over 100 years. And what were their economies like in that period, post-slavery, pre-independence? Similar Post- agricultural, still ag- sugar-based, I assume. Agricultural, sugar-based, um, some diversification into, into other, kinds of, other kinds of crops, one difference that people would point to, and we can come back to this maybe later, uh, one fairly significant difference between Jamaica and Barbados is that relates to the size of the two, of the two islands. So Courtney Blackman, who is the former central bank governor of Barbados, has written about this. Uh, Barbados being much smaller, what, one, one of the differences is that when the slaves were freed in Barbados, there really wasn't any much land for them to be able to inherit or occupy. So they ended up uh, working mostly as uh, kind of wage laborers for their, their former masters. Whereas in Jamaica, there was lots of uninhabited land uh, because Jamaica is a much bigger island about. Jamaica is roughly the size of Rhode Island, physical space. Barbados is um, probably not even a, maybe a tenth of the size of Jamaica. And so one of the consequences of that was that you had uh, former slaves going off into very rural areas uh, and not in necessarily in close proximity to their former slave owners. In Jamaica. In Jamaica. And black, sort of the Blackman hypothesis is this, this led to Barbados, um, the inhabitants of, of, of Barbados becoming relatively uh, more e- educated more quickly uh, than uh, the former slaves did in Jamaica because by being, you know, in close proximity to educated peoples, they assimilated uh, uh, language and reading and writing more quickly than, than they did in Jamaica. Doesn't necessarily follow. It could be true. but could, could be true. Not, mostly it would say working for a former slave master as a wage earner would be a pretty brutal transition. <laughs> I think you own your own land and stand on your own two feet. I don't know. But obviously there, there are differences. The, qu- the question I had, I think maybe it's more important, is that come independence mm-hmm. in the early to mid-60s, what were their relative standards of living? Yes, so the, so the relative standards of living were slight, slightly higher in Barbados, about, if I, uh, if I can remember the numbers off the top of my head, something like uh, $3,700 per capita, something like that in Barbados. Jamaica was around uh, 2600 uh, So there were some, 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 some differences there. So both relatively poor, but not desperately poor. Exactly. Uh, but Middle income developed. Uh, but Barbados... Uh, more successful than Jamaica. Yes. So over the over the course of the, the following forty years, uh, there's a big gap in income that develops. So the gap's about you know somewhere around a thousand dollars at the time of independence, and uh, by the you know by two thousand two or so, uh, Barbados is close to sort of ten thousand dollars per capita, and Jamaica is still somewhere in sort of the mid mid three thousands. Well, okay. So so the this gap, goes back to the black is it black one. Yes, 
the Blackman hypothesis would be, well, they had all this human capital, and so they had an advantage to start with. That's why they shot ahead. Yeah, although, I, 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 if you look at the data, I don't, I don't think the differences, the initial differences in human capital at the time of independence are big enough to explain that, kind of, that, that, kind, of, that kind of divergence. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, but, so we'll put that to the side yeah. for now. So what's your hypothesis? So, the, and what do you explore in the paper? Yeah, so our hypothesis is that if you actually look at the policies as opposed to the institutions, and we're making the distinction between policies and institutions, institutions that we're making in the paper is the following. Institutions we think of, you know, kind of those three things that I listed, uh, constitutional protection of private property, English common law, Westminster parliamentary democracy, things that you inherited from your colonial past, yeah. colonial past as opposed to, for instance, macroeconomic policy choices that are made within the context of that institutional framework. So policies would be, you know, what do you, what do, you, do you choose to run a large or small fiscal deficit? Do you choose to have a floating or fixed exchange rate? Uh, do you have tax policy? Tax policy, free trade. Those are those are the kinds of uh, things we mean by policy. And our hypothesis is uh, that it was the policies that the Jamaican government decided to adopt in the post-independence period. In particular, the policies that were adopted in the early 70s. Uh, that were quite different than the policies that Barbados adopted that led to this divergence in, in economic performance. Now, again, going back to our earlier conversation about controversy, you wouldn't think that would be controversial. But, again, if you don't know those, this literature, it, it's been a little bit challenging for economists to show, even though we have this a priori presumption that good policy leads to good outcomes, for it to lead to growth uh, mm -hmm. over a sustained period of time, in this case, one or two generations, is more controversial, harder to demonstrate in the kind of cross-sectional mm -hmm. analysis where you look across right. countries at different policies. So what's nice about this, the reason I found the paper so interesting, is that this really is the, something close to a controlled experiment. It's not literally a controlled mm -hmm. experiment, of course, but it, it has some of the flavor of it that you'd hope for, and you're not going to get tangled up in... Some of the measurement issues, for example, that we were just talking about a minute ago with, you know, is the property rights regime a 7.3 or a 6.4 or how many standard deviations on some arbitrary mm -hmm. index. Uh, and we interviewed, I interviewed Paul Collier recently who's done work on democracy and violence. And for me, that kind of work, the statistical part, not the case study part, the statistical work is prone to these kind of um, uh, ambiguities. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so what did you find? What's your... Uh, what, what do you find the difference between the two policies, and what do you, why do you think they're important? Yeah. So, let me, so let, me, let me step back just a second and frame it just a little bit more. And one of the reasons um, that economists have focused a lot on sort of long-run growth rates, and you know, since the work of Solo, which basically showed that things like savings rates um, you know, in a standard kind of growth model – don't have a permanent effect on growth rates, but only have an effect on levels of income in the long run. Economists have become very, became very obsessed, particularly following the work of Paul Romer, with finding things that you know, would affect the growth rate as opposed per permanently, as opposed to uh, just permanently affecting levels. And one of the lessons of this paper, I think, is to sort of is to point, is to point out something which Solo himself in subsequent writings has really tried to underscore, which is that even things which don't have a permanent effect on growth rates still have an enormous effect on standards of living, <laughs> right? Sure. Because if you temporarily grow faster than another, if, another country, if temporary means, let's say, 20 years, if you grow by, you know, one percentage point faster than another country for 20 years, we know from the law of compounding that can actually have a big effect. And Barbados and Jamaica are sort of examples of that. So uh, in the case of Jamaica in 1973, uh, there's an oil price shock. Uh, lots of countries are hit by hit by this at the same time, uh, particularly small open economies, big oil import, importers. And um, in response to the external environment, Jamaica decides to essentially, um, you know, run bigger deficits rather than rather than adjusting to the to the shock. They try to finance it, so they run bigger government deficits. They borrow lots of money, and the international capital markets don't spend it very wisely. Um, they nationalize some industry. Uh, and decide to kind of go on a kind of un, unabashed sort of uh, policy of social expenditure in spite of the kind of uh, worsening economic climate. Barbados is hit by the same shock, but uh, Barbados has some adjustments. Smaller island. Smaller island. Imports less oil, I presume, or not? 
less oil, but not necessarily less, less oil per capita. Yeah, okay. Um, and so Barbados is exposed in many, in, 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 in many, in many similar ways. Uh, and they and they do have their own adjustment problems. And Barbados runs uh, a big deficit for a year or so, but they but they decide to retrench, whereas to make it continues to kind of run this expansionary policy. Um, Barbados also very importantly never actually um, in the in the midst of uh, external deficits, and particularly current account deficit, deficits that led to um, a temporary depletion of reserves. Barbados never imp- imp- imposed, imp- imposed uh, restrictions on trade never imposed uh, ex- restrict, uh, extreme restrictions on the use of foreign exchange. Uh, Jamaica really, uh, as, a, as a response to the foreign exchange shortage, decided to uh, put very strong restrictions on imports uh, and an ever kind of spiraling list of kind of import restrictions that led to various kinds of um, licensing regimes and other kinds of rent-seeking and, 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 and corruption. But well, see, Jamaica should be really rich because they and with lots of jobs because they got the protectionism, so they got all those jobs, and they got the stimulus <laughs> for all that deficit spending. So they should be booming, but they're not evidently during this time period. No, they don't. Do they boom a little bit for a while? For a couple of years, um, things look okay. Uh, coming out, uh, coming coming into the seventies. So actually, in the, in, the, in the period right up to seventy seven, but most of that was really driven by actually the. Uh, kind of booming commodity prices coming out of the 60s. Starting in 73, Jamaica goes into basically a 14-year economic decline. And, and even though things are, and what's really important here is that things are difficult for Bar- Barbados as well, as I've noted. Barbados doesn't boom during this period. Barbados grows by about 1.2% per year in per capita terms. But Jamaica's contracting by 2.3% per year. Huge difference. So it's a 3.5 percentage yeah. point difference for 14 years. Yeah. And so that alone, that that bl- set of blunders, presuming that there is that correlation causation there, is going to vastly widen that standard living difference. Exactly. And and again, just to really underscore the point, all those policy blunders, as you call them, pol- just call them, just call them policy choices to be neutral. Okay. All those pol- all those policy choices that Jamaica makes uh, versus the ones that Barbados makes are things that if you were to kind of look at something like the Solo model. Uh, You'd see those are these are just going to be these are going to be temporary effects okay? before this year. Yes, uh, or for or five, for, or, or for, or for five yeah. years, but the cumulative effect of you know a series of bad policies, the, the cumulative effect of those temporary effects over fifteen twenty years is big. And then I guess the issue would be coming out of that if you could fix them, uh, if you start out at three thousand per capita versus ten thousand, and, and they both grow it. Let's say they both do great and they grow three percent a year. Mm-hmm. You're still way behind, right. and, and it's harder to to do well. So you, you dig yourself into a much deeper hole. That sort of presumes there's a there's a sort of natural rate of growth that if you got it right, you could do three percent. It, it rules out the possibility that if you did a bunch of really stupid things, you couldn't grow at seven or ten. Right? We sort of have this mechanical view. It seems to me sometimes mistakenly of growth that yeah two or three, which is what sort of the American good times are. Um, but if you really messed up, <laughs> blundered, you wouldn't be stuck at two or three. You could, you'd think you could grow at seven or ten and, and catch up. Well, certainly, I mean, certainly that's the, that's what theory predicts. If you look around the world, there are lots of examples of developing countries that are actually growing, at, you know, much faster rates. Putting the last, you know, year aside, things are going to be yeah. are going to be much slower this year. But from you know, sort of the early two thousands, uh, really starting in the mid nineties. Through 2007, we have a record period of economic growth in emerging markets, and so there are a number of countries that have actually have been growing at uh, you know rates that are, are much higher than the three than percent. But Jamaica wasn't one of them. Was not, Jamaica was not one. So, so for 14 years they were in they were declining. Did they change their policies at the end of the 14 years? Yeah. So the the government that was in place when this decline began uh, gets booted booted out in 1980 through um, an election. Through an election, democratically. Uh, peaceful transition. Well, the, 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 the election was not entirely. There, there was lots. There was violence around the election, but the election itself was free and fair. Uh, but it was it was a very contentious election. And who was thrown out? Uh, Michael Maley and the, and the People's National Party were thrown out of power in 1980. Okay. Replaced by replaced by Edward Siaga and the uh, Jamaican Labor Party. And what was their policy? They were. Uh, they were they were they were more market oriented. Uh, they did not completely embrace uh, what we might call sort of Washington consensus type policies. Uh, 
initially. It wasn't until really kind of about 1988, 89, when Manly comes into power for the second time, uh, that Jamaica really undertakes a pretty big sea change of policies. So Manly comes back in 889 and embraces the Washington Consensus? Sort of? Reluctantly. <laughs> so that, that would be a balanced budget, low tax rates, low inflation, open borders, more or less. That would be the main... And, and, yes, an attempt to move to those, those, those sorts of policies. And, and the big thing Jamaica has to do, or att- attempted to do in the late 80s, was to start to stabilize the deficits, inflation, uh, and, really, and, and really, really tackle those problems. Right, they're going to bear some costs to make that transition. Presumably. Exactly. And we can talk a little, I mean, a, little, a little bit about that if you want to. I mean, one of the things that I've noticed in some of the work that I've done uh, for Jamaica and on Jamaica, uh, other than this paper, is that Jamaica is very successful, uh, reasonably successful, in getting the macroeconomic environment under control, sort of bringing inflation down to, you know, sort of uh, levels that are sort of not sort of a 20%, but closer to 10%. Uh, bringing down the external deficit, starting to run budget surpluses, primary surpluses, uh, and creating a more stable macro environment. But at what time period? This is they do this starting in the late '80s. It takes them until sort of the mid to late '90s to really to stabilize to stabilize things. It's a, it's a it's a it's a long slow battle because you know bringing inflation down when you've lost credibility uh, is very is very hard. But one of the things that you notice about Jamaica is that even though they've been able to stabilize the macro environment, that's sort of a necessary but not uh, sufficient condition uh, for growth. There are lots of other kind of microeconomic issues uh, they've not uh, they've not yet uh, tackled. And you also have the problem which you alluded to earlier, which is that the path back out of decline doesn't necessarily have the same steepness as the as, as, as going in, in into decline. The kind of the gradient coming out is, is much higher because of you know what you call sort of hysteresis effects. If you have negative growth for 14 years and you've got a fairly young population, particularly of young men, uh, guess what happens to crime rates? Um, and so by having high periods of unemployment and economic decline, you create an environment in which crime becomes a significant problem. And you destroy the incentive for human capital accumulation, savings, all kinds. You've got some, all kinds of, you've got some behavioral, exactly. cultural challenges there. Exactly, exactly. And so now Jamaica is dealing with, uh, with that in addition to you know, the, the, macro, the macro problems. But you mentioned that they had a 14-year decline. That was 73 to 87, presumably. Mm-hmm. You suggested that 87 to 90-something, they're trying to get their house in order. Slow growth. But they re- they had positive growth, positive growth, but very, but really, really anemic. And has it been better since the mid to late nineties? Not much. Not much. Not much. So I guess the question would be, well, let's go to Barbados. What's going on there? So Barbados, I don't know as as as, as great detail as to make, but Barbados has been what I would call a stable, but not spectacular story of growth. And, but it turns out that you know, stable but not spectacular can actually get you a long way. Yeah, yeah. $10,000 a $10,000 for Yapa. Pretty good. Yeah, and, and you really see it. I mean, so, you know, when you go to Jamaica versus Barbados, you really see the difference between a sort of a country that's sort of $10,000 per capita and a country that's $3,000 per capita and has had very little real growth over the last uh, 30-something years. Uh, Barbados is a, is a much safer co- country. It feels much safer. I'm not. I should portray it, say it very clearly here. I'm from Jamaica originally, so I'm. You know, I'm, if anything, I'm biased towards right. saying good things about you know my the, my country of my birth. Uh, but there there really are very big differences. And Barbados has a much higher literacy rate, um, which again is related to the fact, in, in part, to the fact that you've when you have um, better economic management, there's there are greater resources to invest back into human capital, spending on health, education, and so on. And so you really just see the cumulative, uh, cumulative effect of uh, these differences in policy. But Barbados followed closer to the Washington Consensus from 73 on, you're saying, and didn't have that 15-year interregnum of disaster. Yes, and, it, I, and, and, and I should say, by using, using the term wa- the Washington Consensus, I may you know, be, be just, by, just by the virtue of the fact that I use that term, I may turn off some of our, yeah, our, our, our listeners. You, could say it, you want to say it differently? Go ahead. We'll yeah. use it. I would say, 
I but, should have repeated it. It was no, my fault. No, 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 <laughs> it's my fault. I mean, it, it's, an, it's, an, it's, a, but it's an easy catchphrase. But when you say the Washington Census, everyone knows what you mean. Right. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is that you immediately lose half, the, half, of your, half of your audience because they think that you've got some ideological bias. Or you're a tool of the multinational aid agencies exactly. whose goal is to turn the world into crony capitalism yeah. or something. So all I'm talking about is good policies. What, what, what are my good policies? Policies that create uh, a stable macroeconomic environment uh, with you know, low inflation, manageable budget deficits, uh, and an, an environment in which there's an incentive to actually um, invest, save, and accumulate human capital. And do we see, I'm curious, we didn't really talk about this, but entrepreneurship. Um, do you see that differences in that between the two, the two countries? Because one of my things I've become fascinated with in the last you know eighteen months in, this, in the middle of this crisis is the role of uncertainty. And when we were talking earlier about the rule of law, rule of law is one really dramatic example. If you don't have it, your incentive to invest in the future is very small. Uh, clearly, if you don't know what your tax rate is going to be in six months or twelve months, or whether you think the economy is going to be booming or dying in six or twelve months. Your desire to take risk with your well, I'll give you. I'll give you a good example uh, that uh, that speaks to that issue. So, what's really interesting, I think, about the Jamaica uh, case is that this Jamaica is not Zimbabwe, right? So, and this is what I mean by differences between the sort of policies versus institutions. This is not a government a government that in the seventies, you know, just expropriated everything right. and was throwing people in jail. And it was not. This is not, this is not what happened. It's a government that undertook a different set of policy choices. They had the rule of law. Because they had the they rule of law. were a democracy mostly, and, kind and, of, pretty much. But so in particular, coming to your point about incentives now, one of the things that happened in the 70s was the Jamaican government decided to institute a, a levy on bauxite production, a tax levy. The Jamaican what government production? Uh, bo- the production of bauxite, which is used oh. in, in the production of, of um, aluminum. Uh-huh. The, the Jamaican the government, the Manly government at the time, felt that they weren't getting a fair share uh, of of, um, of the royalties uh, from from bauxite production, and decided that they wanted to increase the tax rate, or they just needed another source of revenue. Right. Yes. Yeah, so this is this, this is this is this is what this is this is one way to do it, and so the bauxite companies um, you know resisted this very very strongly, and actually took the government, the American government, to uh, to court. There's something called the International Center for the Settlement Disputes. And the ICSD actually ruled that there was no expropriation. The government had proceeded in a legal fashion. But guess what? The bauxite companies decided to vote with their feet. And Jamaican, uh, Jamaican bauxite production never, has never recovered to the levels uh, that existed prior to uh, the implementation of, of the levy. Hmm. Um, and so that's uh, an example. But it, I mean, it's, obviously it's possible they may have just used most of it up. Uh, are there still the opportunity for bauxite? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. There is. Um, but it, it's it's fairly widely accepted uh, that this was a kind of direct uh, response by the multinationals to essentially the imposition of un- un- uncertainty. Um, if the government's going to sort of change the the tax regime that arbitrarily, the um, question is, what else you know might they do? Do you see any effects elsewhere? I wonder if there were other people who left. Well, interestingly, I mean, interesting that you mentioned that. I mean, I, I'm a U.S. citizen now. I moved to this country in 1978. The other effect of changes in policies were that um, lots of uh, skilled people decided to leave the country because um, it became harder to undertake the kinds of activities that are that are easier to undertake in an, in an environment that's relatively freer from a policy perspective. So lots of scientists, including my parents, <laughs> Actually left uh, the country during that time because it was you know if you were um, working in industry as my, my my father was a chemistry working in in industry it became difficult more difficult to get access to certain kinds of raw materials and supplies because of import restrictions and so generally just things became more difficult to do uh, uh, became more difficult to sort of function in that environment and people a lot of people got frustrated with that and decided to to, to leave. In the words of uh, Michael Manley, um, you know, there are five flights a day to Miami if you don't like our policies, and people 
going on. And, I, and by the way, I should, I should, I should, I should add that, you know, uh, that both my parents were actually PNP supporters, <laughs> but still left. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting because often they'll stop those flights just one way to avoid that kind of flight of talent. Right. So, so again, it's but so, like you say, it's a free. What's so interesting about Jamaica is it's it's a completely free vocal, I mean, pretty vocal press. Uh, just so it's, it's again, it's not Zimbabwe. It's just policies that were just um, free and open, but just not particularly. So, what beautiful. lessons do you draw from the, these stories? So, the, so I, I draw a couple lessons. One, policy really matters. Mm-hmm. Um, this is not saying that institutions don't matter. Um, but for governments that are actually thinking about um, what to, what to do to <clears throat> to foster kind of better economic outcomes, it's sort of boring, sort of plain vanilla stuff to say. But macroeconomic policy really matters. Uh, in a sub- set of subsequent papers, we look at sort of more microeconomic issues, but that's a story for another day. The other the other the other big lesson I think out of this, uh, which is again related to the first point, is that again the path out of decline is much steeper. There's a much steeper gradient than the path into decline. And so it's very... Meaning it's harder to get out. It's harder to get out. You'd think it'd be easier because you think there'd be a lot of low-hanging fruit, a lot of opportunities, things that have been messed up. And we see examples of this post-war and some some cases, not all, I think people tend to look at the, probably the exceptions. Uh, but sometimes it's easy to grow when you're starting so, at a very no, low it's place. Certainly, it's certainly true if you're coming out of a year where you've grown by negative 10%. That you know, for a year or two, you can get sort of you know, it's, it's get positive economic growth, um, and, and fairly fairly high numbers. But in terms of sort of rebuilding the society, so to yeah, speak, when you've shrunk for fifteen. You shrunk for fifteen years. It's yeah. very very it's very very hard to to, un- to undo those effects. Let me challenge the first claim about policy mattering. Um, see what you have to say. Ed Lehmer was a guest on this program uh, recently talking about macroeconomics, and he said, you know, the last 50 or so years of American economic history is 2 3% economic growth year in, year out. Yes, there's an occasional recession. Right now we're in a really bad one. We've had sort of two uh, particularly severe-ish post-World War II recessions. We had a number Mm -hmm. of relatively mild ones. Um, But pretty much 2 3%. Year in, year out, to something per capita. We've sustained that during high taxes, high tax rates, low tax rates, big deficits, small deficits. Uh, had pretty much free trade. I say pretty much, but the main thing is it hasn't changed much over that regime. So that maybe is not so important. But in terms of the standard things in America that we look at for macro policy, which would be deficit spending, tax rates. Um, and some issues about maybe how we treat capital gains and other things. There's been quite a bit of variation. There's not much variation in outcomes. It's pretty smooth. So how does that? How do you reconcile that with your story? I would say that's the, the perspective you just outlined is, is a perspective that's very much perspective of, of, of thinking about the variation relative to sort of the U.S. only. So you know, kind of relative to sort of you know, you think of sort of democratic regimes versus republican regimes, for instance. I agree. There is it hasn't been a great deal of variation in U.S. policy. It's, the very variation is much less than the rhetoric, but if you think about the U.S. versus other countries, I think there you do see um, very, very big differences potentially, right? I mean, again, just sort of going back to the example of Jamaica, right? Uh, so we've kind of come to take for granted two or three percent per year sort of steady growth in the U.S. That's a result of again not much very not much not a great deal of very variation in policy, I think, relative to kind of a U.S.-only regime. But you compare it to other countries around the world, Latin America in the 70s and 80s, uh, I mentioned Jamaica already, uh, go to Africa. I think when you th- think about the, the, the comparison from that perspective, I think I'm pretty persuaded by the view that policy really does matter quite a bit. But you kind of jump to the conclusion that that there hasn't been much variation in policy between Republicans and Democrats. I do think that's generally true. Um, but you could argue mm-hmm. that, say, top marginal tax rates, which is a big contentious issue, we're going to about to enter into it again if we end up funding, trying to fund health care, cap mm-hmm. and trade. Mm-hmm. Um, big debate in the 80s. The mm-hmm. marginal tax rates are cru- crucial to economic growth. So said the supply siders. Mm-hmm. They came down tremendously under Reagan. Uh, the economy grew, grew very quickly. Of course, it was coming out of a really nasty recession. 
and, and monetary period monetary contraction. So maybe it's not so surprising. Followed by uh, eventually a Clinton administration that raises marginal tax rates. Now you'd have to argue that they raised them, but not very much. It was mainly symbolic. Would that be your claim? So we haven't come close to yes, swinging uh, back to the eight, to the seventy percent high, or I think that was that's the right. No, that's right. Maybe even ninety right. at some point. That's right. No, I mean, I, um, again, you know, I, I think that the t- marginal tax rates under, under the Clinton regime were not much different than they were under Reagan. They were raised, but yeah. at the high level, but not exactly. Very much. So, so that's right. I think you know, within certain. Um, Certain ranges, I don't think these changes make much of a difference, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's probably, you know, there's good theory that that, that that supports that. But once you get out of those, the range of those parameters, uh, I do think that uh, some of these changes do do really have an effect. Let's move to a different topic. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we got about 15 minutes left, and before we started taping this, we started talking about some of the work you're in the middle of right now. So, which I, I'm very interested in. Related to what we've been talking about, which is, you know, you have all these different, both empirical and case study approaches, trying to cope with what is essentially a very complex system, right? So you've got to put it mildly. What? <laughs> to put it mildly. Yeah. So you have different policy regimes. You have different institutional regimes. You have different natural and national characteristics of the of the native population or whatever country you're looking at. So trying to explain either cross-sectional growth differences or time series growth differences, differences at a point in time across countries or differences over time within or across countries is, one could say it's possible, but as, as you mentioned, again, before we got started, there seems to be a correlation between the ideology of the researcher and their empirical work. So is is that... Am I being too cynical there, or is that a fair assessment of what how people come out? I'm I, sure they wouldn't describe it sure, that way. Sure, sure. No, I think I think I think it's I think it's very fair to start with the observation that uh, people are prone to sort of you know kind of confirmatory bias, yeah. if, if you will. And what I try to do, I'm gonna I'm gonna now, now try to argue that I'm you're free of it. You and I are we're the only two people. We're the only people in the world. Right? And we're sitting at a, you know, at a great university. We're sitting here at Stanford, and it turns out, even within Stanford, we're the only two. It That's right. <laughs> but, I, but, I will, but, but I will try to give you a piece of evidence to okay. see about my own personal experience with research, okay. where I actually did change my mind on something. All right. Very exciting. Um, okay. So, uh, the, and, and this relates to the book that I'm working on. So the idea of the book is to sort of, you know, kind of try to address this specific point that you've raised, which is, that if you think about the question of economic reform, which we've been talking about implicitly, we're talking about policies, we're talking about changing policies, that's what we, what we mean by economic reform. Um, roughly 25 years ago, uh, we had the emergence of what was called the Washington Consensus. Um, the Washington Consensus today is no less controversial than it was when it was unveiled by in the speech by Secretary, then Secretary of the Treasury, James Baker, uh, at Seoul, South Korea, at the World Bank IMF meetings. And if you ask... To economists, the question, is economic reform helpful or, or harmful for developing countries, you'll get very different answers depending on, as you put it, where they come out on sort of their kind of ideo- on the ide- ideological spectrum. And they'll be able to cook up a really sophisticated study that proves they're right. That's even right. Even though they're the opposite of the other guy who proves that she's right. That's right. Although, although I, I would argue, and the book argues, that a lot of the, the more public uh, discussion, as opposed to the j- discussion that's taken place in, in journal articles, the public intellectuals on this on this issue, and I'm, I won't I won't mention any names, but the public intellectuals on this issue have been a little bit less tethered by systematic evidence and more just to, on sort of you know kind of personal views. Sure, it's always the case. It's always the case, and but that and, and that's and 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 that at that level of sort of public discussion, that really does have an effect on policy. Yep. And I argue in the book that if we really want to make progress on this issue and not just, you know, worry about the scoring debating points, but actually really try to understand what is helpful and harmful, we need a more objective measure of whether policies are expected to help or hurt a country that undertakes them. So I just, again, just to sort of put it in perspective, that's the key question, right? Are policy going to help or hurt? And the, there's two ways to, to answer that. One is by debating. And, and making your case that mm-hmm. this policy is really going to be great or that policy is going to be great, or debating with numbers, bringing some sophisticated statistical evidence that, as we listeners to the show know, I'm, I'm very skeptical of because it can often be worked in a way that seems to be consistent with the answer in advance. 
So you're going, you want to find us, you're trying to find us a third way. Well, I'm I'm trying to strike. I wouldn't call, I wouldn't call sorry. it call a third that's way. That's, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm going I'm going to I'm going to be on the empirical side. I'm going to be on the empirical yeah. side, and I'm going to be in in, in 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 the work that I've done. I've you know I've 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 tried to not rely too much on the bells and whistles, but to really present the data very honestly and to say, look, there are lots of things we actually can't control for, um, but I'm going to present the evidence as as honestly as I can, and kind of let the you know let the let let the reader decide whether it sort of fits the, the theoretical framework. And I am actually going to argue in the book that the, the 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 best sort of almost unbiased barometer we have in some sense of whether policies are expected to help or hurt developing countries is to look at how stock markets in these countries respond to uh, the announcement of uh, of policy changes, because the stock market's only bias is whether policy is expected to create or destroy value. And I don't think that's the end of a policy discussion, but it's not a bad place to begin a policy discussion. Because if, on average, we're creating value, uh, as we know, then we can you know, have an argument about, about equity. Yeah. <laughs> right? if, we, if, we, if, we, if we're generating some efficiency, we can then talk about whether there's some, quote-unquote, fair way to, to redistribute things, or if we, want to have, if we want to have that discussion. And so... By actually looking at how the stock market responds to a wide range of policy changes in developing countries, whether it be uh, programs to reduce inflation, the decision to open up capital markets to foreign investment, um, or, or in the case of, uh, of debt relief, uh, decisions by multinationals to, or international banks to forgive the debt of developing countries. And I, I mentioned earlier that um, you know that uh, if we were talking about the fact that not, neither of us are, are of, course, of course subject to confirmatory bias. When I actually started studying the issue of debt relief in developing countries, uh, being from a developing country, Jamaica, uh, that uh, that really became very heavily indebted due to the policies I mentioned earlier uh, during the eighties. As a college student, I was under the impre- I was under the, the strong view that of course it would make sense to relieve Jamaica's debts. Um, and got to help. Yeah, got to help. And, and in general, debt relief for for poor countries has to be a good idea. You'd think. Um, that was sort of my, the bias that I sort of came to this discussion with. But when I actually started looking at the evidence, <laughs> um, as sort of guided by theories we have about whether debt relief is helpful or harmful, I changed my mind. Uh, I mean, the evidence basically changed my mind. And what was the nature of that evidence? What did you find? So here, so... Here, here's the basic point. Some very clever th- uh, theoretical work was done by people like Jeff Sachs and Paul Krugman. It actually was really started by, by, by in the corporate finance literature by Stuart Myers. Um, I forget the exact date of the paper, uh, but paper, papers on debt overhang in the corporate finance literature basically inspired people like Jeff Sachs and Paul Krugman to talk about um, whether uh, debt overhang existed in the context of, de- of developing countries in the 80s. And the basic idea is that... <clears throat> When a company has too much debt, at some point, uh, new shareholders are deterred from actually investing in the, in, the, in the company because all the benefits of investment accrue to the, the debt holders. In the context of, of a developing country, you can think of um, debt, too much debt deterring investment because high levels of debt basically imply high you know, future tax rates uh, because governments need to raise taxes to service the external debt. And so... The Krugman Sachs showed in the context of um, some, uh, some kind of neoclassical style sort of macro models that there can actually be a situation where the country, um, country's creditors are made better off as well as the country's made better off by actually reducing the country's debt. And so if you subscribe to the view, so kind of this debt overhang view, you say, well, writing down the debt is actually going to generate more investment and higher growth. It's going to be good for countries. On the other hand, you have... Um, People who argue that, well, writing down the debt of a country is going to uh, hurt it in international capital markets. It's going to damage its reputation. It's going to raise its borrowing costs. It allows the government to persist with profligate policies. And so on average, it's going to have a negative effect. It's, so it's really an empirical question. It's just an empirical question. And I actually went to the data and looked at um, how stock markets in developing countries, um, particularly Latin American countries under the Brady Plan, Responded to the, the announcement that they were going to receive debt relief. The Brady Plan was in 19... 1989 for Mexico, early 90s for other Latin American countries, which tried to get Latin American countries out from under these debt burdens Ex- under the under the idea that 
it would liberate them to do the, to do better. Yes, and and, and and very and very importantly, under the uh, the preconditions that they ex- accepted other policy changes as well. So, not going too much into the details. The, the short answer to the story is that for the countries in Latin America, debt relief actually did create value. Marcus views this as being efficient, and as we were working, productive, this, productive, yeah. productive. We asked the, then the question: Could you extrapolate on these results to think about the really poor countries of the world that <clears throat> people like? Bono and Angelina Jolie have been you know, advocating for the, you know, the, the Burkina Faso is the most ambiguous of the world. And as he went to the data to try to answer that question, he said, hmm, <clears throat> there's a problem here. There are no stock markets in these countries, yeah. in a lot of these countries, which clued us into the fact that there's something very different about these sort of highly indebted poor countries of the world as opposed to the middle-income Brady countries of the world. And it turns out if you look at the really highly indebted poor countries of the world, the ones that actually received the most debt relief <clears throat> under the Glen Eagles Declaration in 2005 in Scotland, um, which, that was preceded by the so-called HIPAA initiative, these countries are actually in many ways, um, they're, they're, they're different from the Brady countries in the sense that they don't have a, uh, much of a market for private investment. And, beca- and so the debt relief basically works in environments where there's a market for private investment, a market for private capital, uh, a market for the debt overhang channel to basically spur more investment and growth when you write down. Because you're expecting tax. lower taxes. But in these poorer countries, you might get higher taxes when you relieve the debt because now they can start over again. Well, what even getting away from the tax issue, it's just a matter of um, – in the, in the poor the, the channel is, is that as you, as, you, as you write down debt, you have private investment responding to right. better investment. But there isn't any there. there, there, there anyway. There's not much for private investment climate to begin with in these countries. And right. so the symptom for which debt relief is, that, that debt relief is sort of designed to alleviate, isn't, it isn't there. Right. Which doesn't mean you shouldn't help poor countries. But what it means is if you're serious about helping poor, really poor countries, debt relief is not going to do uh, a great deal to help these countries. And the, the story actually gets even more uh, involved because it turns out that people think that when you write down the debt of a poor country, let's say a country owes $3 billion a year in debt servicing, and let's say it receives uh, in any given year, um, let's say $4 billion of, of aid flows. So on net, it's getting a $1 billion of inflow. People think that if you write down the debt... They say, have $4 billion. Yeah, they're, they're four billion. Turns out that's not the way it works. The reason it doesn't work that way is because the people who uh, the institutions that lend money to these countries, whether it be you know the International Development Assistance Arm of the World, the World Bank, or the IMF, giving concessional loans, these institutions have a balance sheet just like any other financial institution. And guess what? When they write off debt, they've got to make allowances for that, yeah. which means that on balance at least in the aggregate, there are less resources to give in the form of aid. and so A weird kind of crowding out. It, yeah, you get, a, you get a sort of a weird kind of crowding out. And then it turns out that <clears throat> we know in general, in sort of the history of aid flows, is, you know, Bill East really is sort of so it's kind of stringently sort of, you know, kind of pointed out, uh, aid hasn't done, hasn't been particularly successful. But in the world of aid, we know that uh, multilateral aid has been, on average, more effective than bilateral aid. And it turns out that what debt relief effectively does, uh, because um, this sort of a, it turns out there's been sort of a fixed amount of kind of uh, goodwill in the world, is that aid, debt relief goes up, bilateral aid flows go down by roughly the same amount, and so the overall aid, aid pool gets skewed more towards bilateral aid as a result of debt relief. Um, and so there are these, there are these strange, as you said, sort of crowding out effects that, that, that occur um, as a result of, of debt relief. And so if you're really interested in – so as we kind of unpack these issues and look at the stock market, the reason why the stock market was useful is it sort of forced us to think about kind of this almost, if you will, kind of separating hyperplane between those middle-income developing countries and the really poor countries. Uh, as, you try to, as you try to really think about these issues seriously, you realize that, you know um, – it's not so clear that debt relief is going to do uh, be very effective for for the really poor countries, and so that's a case where the data the data changed my mind. Okay, so let me let me um, let me just make a comment, to that, and I want to, we're almost out of time. I want to turn to the the general research agenda you're talking about. Mm-hmm. I, when, when I complain about 
empirical work, I'm really talking about what I call um, sophisticated statistical modeling. Mm -hmm. And I don't want anyone to think who's listening, uh, including you, Peter, that, that I don't think empirical work matters or that facts don't matter or that evidence doesn't matter. They do. Facts matter. Empirical work matters. Evidence is crucial. It's just that the obsession and the profession, in my opinion, with um, multivariate regression and instrumental variables, for example, to try to tease out causation, I think it's been an intellectual dead end, although it's been a very productive strategy for career uh, enhancement. So I, I just want to put that as a footnote. Um, and, and certainly, sometimes the facts just shout at you that, that your hypothesis can't be held and, and you do have to change your mind. And people do change their minds, uh, again, based on evidence. So I think evidence does matter. It's not all about, say, God forbid, just marketing of clever ideas and who can market it the best or spin the best story as the winner, because I think that's not true. I think facts will out, and they matter a lot. In your particular case, I think the challenge of this, the work you're talking about, the, I, I would think the two issues that people would worry about are, one, in some of these countries, stock market's not a particularly thick market. Mm -hmm. it's, it's small. The number of transactions aren't very large. And secondly, I would think that uh, we just did a recent podcast with Justin Fox on the theory of official markets, there's a lot more skepticism mm -hmm. uh, than there once was mm -hmm. about stock markets as information conduits, so uh, that they're prone to behavioral problems, et cetera, crashes, uh, fads, um, et cetera. So wh how do you answer your critics on, on those kind of fronts? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I'll... I'll be more expansive in the in the book. Yeah, <laughs> you got thirty seconds. No, no, you gotta, you, it take as long as you want, but, but go ahead. So the the basic point I would make is that um, you don't have to be an efficient market zealot to think that uh, all 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 you need to believe is that there's that 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 stock markets respond to information because there's a difference between thinking that the prices are always exact always right. Uh, in terms of sort of you know you know sort of getting valuations exactly right, versus prices actually responding to, to news, and so for instance, a lot of people who have sort of had casual conversations with have said, well, you know, don't the events of last year tell you that sort of the fishing markets? Right. To me, I actually look at this last year. Said, Gee, there was a lot of bad news last year. Yeah. <laughs> There's a reason why the stock market tanked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if the right. stock market didn't respond negatively to some of the information, I'd be really worried. Yeah, that's a good point. So that's so that's 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 uh, um, that's sort of the that's sort of the main point that I would make. The other, the second point I would make is that you don't ever want to look at only one economic variable. And so, as I said earlier, the stock market is a place to begin the discussion, not to end it. And so one of the things that I've done, I've tried to do uh, fairly systematically is to look at um, real evidence, uh, meaning not financial market evidence, but evidence on like growth and employment and other things. Mm -hmm. sure. So on the one hand, you're looking at the stock market as a way of trying to evaluate what people expect will happen. And I think at some point you want to actually an ask the question, is, does what people expected to happen, or did what people expect to happen, expected to happen actually occur? Uh, and so you want to see whether the kind of stock market forecast is on average, you know, kind of getting things right by looking at other other evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, again, in the context of you know multiple countries, you know, thin markets and other other data limitations, I think there are real limitations to what you can you can say. I don't think you can ever prove anything empirically, um, and to even persuade people. Uh, of a view empirically is is difficult. What I view my role is is not as not to necessarily um, uh, to win the debate. My view is that my my job as researcher is to bring some more clarity uh, to exactly what you really need to believe to hold on to your pet view. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, in face of in face of uh, the evidence, sort of clearly uh, clearly laid out. That's a nice place to end. My guest is Peter Blair Henry of Stanford University. Peter, thanks for being part of EconTalk. Thank you, Russ. It was a lot of fun. This is EconTalk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more EconTalk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for EconTalk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.